Hey, hello, hi, welcome to and are back to the Equitheory podcast. I am your host, Jill Treese, and this week I am answering a question from patron McKenna. McKenna wrote um, uh, two pages. <laughs> so I am going to read you guys McKenna's backstory and then um, go through some of the questions that she asks because they're like, she asked a bunch of questions about her situation specifically but i decided to give this question its own episode because i feel like this could apply to a lot of horse owners so um like i'll read you guys the what i've highlighted as like the you know to the point question so um you can kind of decide if this is going to be a for you episode or maybe not um so she asks things like that of what are your thoughts on how and when one should use sedation is it possible for the clicker or positive reinforcement way of training to be too slow for a horse's well-being when in your opinion should a professional trainer get involved with a struggling horse as uh, to work hands-on and not just consulting or advising for the owner um, my opinion on the idea that a horse could be too far gone to train. Um, do I think it's ethical to fix a horse in a state of post-trauma recovery and try to reintegrate into a normal way of functioning or just comfortably retire them and see some majority of the reintegration training? Um, she also asked a few questions in relation to um, the popular trainer Warwick Schiller um, and some things on combined reinforcement um, and then there are some others on food transition and um, some of the horse competitions, uh, you know, the quick ones. So uh, that's what this episode is going to be about, you know, talking about her situation specifically, my thoughts on that, and then getting to her question. So if any of those, um, you know, you're interested in talking about, um, I would stay tuned. I, I, like I said, I decided to make this its own episode because it's, like, A, the document is rather long, and while I could go through and cut out a lot of it, I always, I prefer to hear the full backstory as a listener and also I, as a podcaster. So if you guys want me to shorten the patron emails and just kind of get to the point, um, please just let me know. You can shoot me a DM on the Equithery Instagram or just comment on the post and be like, hey, would you mind shortening the questions? It's kind of boring. Um, I try to read them spicily, but <laughs> sometimes it doesn't happen. Um, but I figured that this episode was going to get a little bit esoteric and um, touch on more philosophy-based stuff than just strictly answering a question on how to work through a behavioral issue um, and some ideas on how I would work through it. Um, so... With that said, I hope that you guys enjoy the episode and let's get into it. You silly goose, did you really think we were going to jump right into the content? Heck no! We gotta do the ad first, okay? I don't know if there's one ad or two ads. I still haven't quite figured out Podbean. It might happen. It might not. But uh, anyway, you're definitely going to get the Patreon ad. So if you're interested in uh, having a question like Patron McKenna's answered uh, in this format, then uh, listen to this ad because it might be just what you're looking for for the low, low price of whatever tier you decide on. <laughs> Okay, guys, when you become a patron of the podcast by joining at patreon.com slash equitheory, you'll gain access to all kinds of opportunities to benefit you and your horse. Being an equitheory patron means that you're able to gain a like-minded community of progressive equestrians via our Discord server, ask your burning training questions, and have them answered on the podcast, live monthly Q&A Zoom events, and the option to schedule phone call consults with me to help you work through a behavioral or training-related issue, and at the very highest tier, the option to submit up to 30 minutes of video per month for me to review and critique. You can break it up however you would like. So the Patreon is set up to accommodate budgets and you're free to cancel at any time penalty free. So become a patron of the podcast today. Help me and the horses and help yourself. All right. So add out of the way, intro out of the way. It's time to get into the content, right? No, <laughs> that would be silly and make way too much sense. Um, I am actually 
just kind of want to talk to you guys for a second because I need to let the listeners know that if you have been a patron um, over the last couple of months and have sent me a message and I did not answer it, please shoot me an email with, you know, a screenshot or whatever, just some amount of proof um, that I did not answer your question at equitheory at gmail.com because, um, wow, I got so many messages, first of all. And second of all, um, a, a while ago, like a week, no, it wasn't a week. Oh my God. Like several weeks ago, like before I moved a month, two months, God, my timeline is so messed up. It could have been six months ago. I don't know. But um, I got, like, my Patreon told me when I opened it up that they were reconfiguring their inbox system. Burp, of course. Why not within the first 10 minutes? Um, Anyway, so um, they reconfigured it, and I lost a bunch of my messages because you used to be able, when I would send out, like, a mass message to all the patrons, it would send as one message um, as like almost like a group chat, but I was the only one that could tell that it was a group chat. Everybody else got it individually. Um, and then they changed it. So when I send out a group message, it's sent to like 50 people. Um, so it buried a bunch of my messages and I went back and I thought I found them, but I guess since they were reconfiguring it, I, some of them just got lost in the mix. Um, so like a week ago, they just popped back up from like months ago and I'm like, oh my God. So I, if, if I wrote you a message, I have got your, <laughs> your question, but if I still haven't answered your question, just for good measure, please shoot me an email with a screenshot of your question in Patreon so I know that you were actually a Patreon or a patron, and uh, I will answer it in an upcoming episode. Um, I do think that I'm probably going to have to break up next week's episode with something other than Patreon questions because I don't like to do them all back to back to back to back, but I do have to get caught up, so... Um, those questions are coming soon, ladies and gentlemen. But um, yeah, so if you do also have a question and you can't wait um, and you are able, you can always ask for a phone call consult and we can work that out. Um, I might also start introducing um, that at the lower tiers and just put time limits on things um, and like add more things like you could send a video blah 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 um but also i'm so pushover that i would just probably do that anyway um so uh, that's something that i'm gonna have to work on at a later date um i still don't have internet out here we're hoping that it'll be in by tuesday of next week so maybe things will get a little bit easier for me but um right now it's been really really difficult to get everything done that i need to So I haven't been as active as I'd like to be, but I'm hoping that will change soon. Um, Anyway, um, to prove my point, it's currently 9.30 the night before, well, the day of that this episode was supposed to go up. But you know what? I told you guys in the last episode that it might be Thursday and this is what's happening. So you know what? We're lucky that I'm recording it right now. Um, I was actually going to record it last night, but I ended up having to go to bed at 7 p.m. because, oh my God, my head hurts so bad. Uh, I woke up with that same headache this morning and I can tell you guys straight up there's nothing worse than going to bed and being like, oh, at least I'll wake up without this headache. And then you wake up and you're like, am I going to still have the headache? <laughs> so um, I chugged coffee, water, and a smoothie with chia seeds and all that mess in there and felt a little bit better but it's I can still feel it in the back of my head it's just not near as bad as it was last night so um I've also had a long talk with my chiropractor today about changing to an anti-inflammatory diet because my body just cannot handle these things uh basically I'm in an excruciating amount of pain uh at baseline it's like a dull ache everywhere um, constantly. And anytime I'm sore, it is cranked up to 11. So, um, we're hoping that will help and that I don't have some autoimmune oddity. Um, but I did test positive for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Don't remember ever having that, uh, rash that you're supposed to have. It's from a tick, the Rocky Mountain Spotted Tick. Uh, fun fact, if you didn't know that about me. Um, but, Yeah, I don't know how that happened, but I have eczema, so I constantly have, like, weird skin things happening, and uh, I get sick all the time, so it's possible I both had an unusual circular rash and also was sick and did not 
think it was anything new. <laughs> oh my god. Did you I I don't know if the mic picked that up, but my shoulder just popped when I laughed and that was ridiculous. Um Okay, anyway, so if any of you medical doctors out there would like to diagnose me over the podcast, you go right ahead. Um, shoot me all your links to uh, how to eat like a better person um, and meal plans, preferably, because I am so... I've just decided that I don't I don't want it to be difficult. That's all. I, I will do it if somebody will do it for me. <laughs> I will eat whatever I'm supposed to eat as long as I don't have to think about it too hard. Um because I've decided that it's just not an area that I care to donate a lot of brain energy to. And I recognize that that is unwise. You uh, you get out of your body what you put into it. Yeah, yeah, I know. And I know that about the horses too. But I, for some reason, I just have an aversion to it. It's I just don't don't want to spend a lot of time cooking. Don't care enough. <laughs> I just want to uh, grab whatever will make my stomach and head stop yelling at me. <laughs> um and yep so i'm just like i just want it to be easy i like tasty food i want to eat better and i want to feel better but i just don't want to put in the effort that's required but you know what a girl signed up for uh hello fresh tonight so we'll see how that goes uh, i'm probably not going to do it for that long but i just you know i need to my hand to be held into my cooking endeavors but um that might be something i talk about on a, a, on a oh my god okay <laughs> On a different podcast. Anywho, so let's get into this question. What do you guys say? Are you ready or do you want me to keep rambling? This is an episode of Dora. Actually, you are supposed to answer out loud. Please answer my question three, two, one now. I hope you answered out loud. And if you didn't, um, I'm embarrassed for you. I'm also embarrassed if you answered me. <laughs> okay, anyway, um, what a fun exercise. Do you feel like you're a part of it now? <laughs> okay, Patron McKenna asks, Hi, Jill. I've been an avid listener of your podcast for a while now and have what feels like a billion questions. And now see, I'm taking a break from reading it already. Um, this is this is this message that McKenna wrote me is what I would do. (laughs) It's like long multifaceted and has a billion questions within it and also all of the detail about her horse. (laughs) And if I was uh, if I was signed up for my own Patreon, this is what I would do. Um, So I love it. Anyway, thank you for being a listener of the podcast. I appreciate it. Uh, McKenna writes, but first, I would like to note that I am a huge fan and greatly appreciate all of your work in providing positive reinforcement research to the less scientific horse community in such an entertaining fashion. Oh my God, that is so nice. Um, Yeah, PSPT dubs. And I know I say this in every episode, so my regular listeners, sorry. Um, But if you are not aware, I do have a resource hub of sorts website. It's called jetequitheory.com. And you can go under the equine EDU tab and you'll find positive reinforcement uh, topics and resources. And each of those tabs have links to different information. Um, The topics page, you can search anything from behavior to ulcers. Uh, I'm working on like trailer loading. I actually have a whole list. Let me read you guys um, actually what the topics are. Sorry, I'm distracted, but I am... I want my website to be something that's genuinely helpful and like you when you go to it you know that you're getting quality research not just like whatever Dr. Google tells you. Um, so on um, my website if you go to equine edu and under topics um, you can search for a specific topic or you can scroll through I have behavior dominance theory hoof, kissing spine, nutrition, saddle fit, separation anxiety, shivers, stalling versus turnout, trailer loading, ulcers, and weaning. And then I also have a list on my phone of ones that aren't up yet, uh, like TAC, um, more stuff about hooves, biomechanics, body work, arthritis. And like, they're just kind of niche things that keep coming up. And when people ask me about them, I like to be able to point them in the direction and be like, here's a list of resources, browse those. Um, and not have to retype it every time, essentially. And also, you guys can just go straight there to look it up. So, um, you know, if you find a bunch of links about a specific topic or your horse has had a specific issue, like, for instance, Zoe just had kissing spine. So there's a kissing spine section where I've done all this research and put it in one place for people that might need it in the future. So if you've done something like that uh, for something niche about your horse, feel free to shoot me an email equithery at gmail.com and I will do my best to include that as I am able like I said don't have internet right now so it's a little bit uh a little bit tricky and some of those that I just mentioned aren't 
finished or even started. They're just up right now because I can't unenable the page. So if it's blank, it's coming soon. I will get there eventually. I'm busy. <laughs> that's that's my spiel. But anyway, I do have that available as well as a positive reinforcement tab that is literally set up to give you everything you need to get started with positive reinforcement. Um, and again, I am always open to feedback. So if you guys have any thoughts or comments on the website, if something's confusing, unclear, formatted, weird, or you think I should add something or take something off, I'm always open to that. So please shoot me an email or a DM. I don't check my DMs as often as I check my emails. Um, and if I don't respond right away, please know that I have at least seen it and I have anxiety about responding to things. Don't know why, just my brain says, mm, we'll do it later. And then I forget. And then it's been four weeks and then I'm like, oh God, <laughs> I'm going to get judged. So there's that. Anyway, continuing on this message. Um, as someone who lives in a very uh, negative reinforcement, natural horsemanship centric community with very limited access to the positive reinforcement community, it's unbelievably comforting to recognize that there are others out there who see things differently like myself. I can't believe I'm reading this fast. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> the work and research you have put into all that you have produced has been invaluable to those of us who are just starting out in this wonderful world of science-based horse training. Thank you so much for all that you do. Well, I just read a big ego booster message. Thank you, McKenna. I actually genuinely appreciate that. It means a lot because like I said, uh, that website is a hell of a lot of work and I really appreciate it when you guys are like, yeah, we use it and it's great because <laughs> uh, sometimes I'm like putting all this work into tediously adding all these links and everything and making it look nice. I'm like, is anybody, does, do people come to my website? Do people use it? Um, so I, I, you know what, if there are four people using it semi-regularly, that's nice. Also, I'm hoping to get a mailing list started when I have internet um, so I can like update you guys when I update my website and then just be like, hey, there's an ulcers tab if you want to check that out, you know? Um, okay, anyway, um, as for my, I'm continuing the message here. As for my question, most revolve around my personal rescue horse, Newt. He is a grade slash unregistered quarter horse gelding that I picked up off a livestock lot in Texas last fall. I have very limited information on his past, but based on his unusual behaviors around human, we strongly suspect that he was raised feral on pasture and was at some point physically abused by humans. He's deeply afraid of human contact, especially when it involves physical touch and the use of handheld tools, i.e. brushes, ropes, halters, carrots, etc. I was not fully aware of how bad his case was until after bringing him home burping in the opposite direction sorry um does I, i'm assuming that grade means unregistered because i am not part of the uh western quarter horse world and i am assuming that's where i would have learned that word for sure for sure but i'm it seems given the context here <laughs> that that means unregistered but why would they call it grade i don't know somebody tweet me jet echo theory that's my twitter tweet me um Okay, that's also somewhere you can give me feedback on the podcast if you want. I'm trying to check my Twitter DMs. I have like 15 to 40 unopened DMs on Twitter, and they stress me out because I want to answer everyone, and I am too busy. I have so many DMs. Oh, my God. Okay, please stay on the topic. Jill, oh, my God. Um, since his arrival five months ago, I have been able to use clicker training to recondition a few of his fears. He's never been aggressive despite his fear, so most of his training revolves around keeping him from bolting when being handled. After months of trust building, I have managed to recondition his fear of human hands into a mostly positive association, and he now willingly walks up to strangers to receive treats, hay pellets, and the occasional molasses cookie. No! Do not give him molasses cookies, lady. No! <laughs> I'm just kidding. Occasionally it's fine, but like... Sugar is bad. Sugar is bad, 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 bad. They get enough of it when they shouldn't. <laughs> um, but I also understand you're like, oh, but it's so it's so tasty and you know they really like it. Um, but that's great. Um, okay. He also greets me very, very happily at the gate and participates in some basic liberty leading and limited grooming behaviors. And now I'm yawning. Um, okay. Must not be breathing enough. <laughs> that being said, he still holds extreme anxiety and fear around humans due to the fear and fact that he is boarded in a public facility with strict safety concerns and rules. He cannot be led outside his stall without any other human or with any humans other than myself present within a few hundred feet and is therefore taken out of his stall as often as I feel he should be. 
He also cannot be handled comfortably up close by anyone other than myself, which has posed some serious issues with the vet's ability to treat him and the farrier's ability to effectively and safely trim his hose. Thus far, we have managed to make it work. He is overall very healthy and happy and is monitored extremely closely for any changes that can negatively affect him. But we are cl- quickly coming to a point where some compromises will have to be made to ensure that he stays healthy. Um, okay, so... Um, McKenna hasn't gotten to her question questions yet in this message. Well, she has. I haven't. I haven't read them yet. Um, but I just kind of wanted to break it up and give my thoughts on, like, the the background intro portion of this. So, um, it's fantastic to work through a horse that has a lot of fear and anxiety and a traumatized past to work with them using positive reinforcement because... Um, those horses that have been abused in the past have a lot of history to work through. So, um, for those of you who are maybe more new to positive reinforcement, um, what happens when humans are constantly mean to and or bad around horses and like resort to a lot of punishment based training and, um, you know, just using, aversives or things that the horses don't like in um like as the predominant way to train um has a tendency to um create negative associations with the human so if you think about the horses that um walk away when they see you coming or bolt to the corner of the field um or are just generally unhappy (laughs) um those horses typically Uh, tend to have negative associations with humans because of their learning history. So um, I prefer to use positive reinforcement because you can't use operant conditioning without using classical conditioning. So positive reinforcement is a part of, or it falls under the operant conditioning um, umbrella. But when you are applying something that a horse likes after the horse does something that you like to hopefully make that behavior happen more often. Um, Like you would give a dog a treat for sitting um, to make him sit more when you cue sit. Um, What also happens is that the animal starts to associate you with that thing that he really likes that you're giving him, whether it's scratches or food or playtime or whatever. Um, Typically with horses, it is treats and scratches because those are their predominant primary reinforcers. They also enjoy social contact, but that can be kind of difficult to implement as a reinforcer. Um, So um, yeah, I would say that, um, you know, like what McKenna is doing is incredibly wise because you have a horse that has had a history of just straight up abuse over and over again horse has not learned that humans are good things he's learned that horses hurt him and cause him pain and scare him and everything about his world is to be feared so um, what clicker training does is it hands over the baton to the horse so and really really oppressive bad, we don't like them, even though we're (laughs) open-minded, traditional training, um, like just the yee-yee nonsense that's like, oh, you must dominate the horse and you gotta show it who's boss. If you gotta take it to the ground, you gotta do what you gotta do. (laughs) Um, that kind is not, um, it's not what we do around these parts. And so when, you deal with a horse that has not just completely shut down after that and is actually still quite afraid and hasn't just given up on existing. Um, it, it can be really daunting to work with them. Um, so it's unfortunate and it breaks my heart that we're having to deal with this for Mr. Newt. Um, that is the cutest name ever. I knew a horse named Newt once and he was very cute also. Um, So I'm picturing that horse. He was like a really, really tall, lanky thoroughbred. Like, I think he was like 17, one and bay with like a little snip on his nose. He was so cute. I love that horse. Um, but anyway, so using positive reinforcement to train him to be okay with these things is also using a classical conditioning process. So, um, if you think of, I don't know. 
say you have a really close friend and every time you hang around this friend, they are just telling you how wonderful you are. You get to go do your favorite things with them, like shopping or hike or riding your horse. <laughs> Let's face it, that's all all of us like to do. Um, and you just you just do a lot of things that you like. You find it very reinforcing to be around them. And also, it's just like they bring good things. So then you begin to associate them with like, oh, they're coming over. Ah, oh, you get excited. And you might not exactly know why, but it's probably due to the fact that you guys always do things that you enjoy and it brings you good feelings and blah, blah, blah. So um, you begin to associate those people with positive feelings. Um, and if you conversely had a friend that came over and only talked about themselves and constantly complained about life and put you down and criticized you, you're going to develop some negative associations with them. Um, also, I am describing myself. <laughs> I am so hard to be around a lot of the time. Um, but that's something that we're working on. <laughs> um, but if you're like that with your horse too, they're going to not want to be around you. I mean, like if you're constantly like, Oh my God, no, st take a step back. Nope, not there, step forward. Oh my God, you're on your lead rope, move. Okay, uh, now you have to stand still for the saddle. You're bored? Oh my God, get over it. You're such a jerk. Just stand there. You know you're supposed to. Be obedient. Like, oh, <laughs> control freak much? Um, also, I'm allowed to make fun of this because this was me. Um, I used to be very, very bad about that. So anyway, uh, it, it is a wonderful thing to to help the horse understand that everything is okay. There is not going to be a massive slew of negative consequences for putting a foot wrong. However, it can take a really long time because if you've constantly been around someone who um, is just wildly oppressive and critical and makes you feel bad about yourself or scares you, it's going to take a long time for you to want to trust them again. Even though McKenna isn't the one that inflicted this torture on this horse, um, you know, the horse has now learned to associate people with that kind of behavior. Um, and uh, I don't know. It's kind of like if if you were a child and you got bitten by a dog and you just assumed that all dogs were bad. It kind of works the same way with horses where they're like, okay, I would just need to be wary of humans in general because they hurt me. Um, and I'm sure it was more than one human. Um, so, oh God, I got to stop saying, um, it's not going to stop. Just get used to it. Um, <laughs> Okay, anyway, so it may take some time is the thing uh, that I'm trying to get out. And it's it's just a process and it can be really, really daunting and really difficult. But it's awesome that he's now uh, willingly walking up to people. That is huge. Uh, I think the thing is what a lot of people see too when horses come out of a state of learned helplessness, like... Um, learned helplessness is usually defined as like the animal's just given up. Like it's not nobody's home. Lights are on, nobody's home. So those are the horses that are dead broke and look dead inside. They're, they don't react to anything. They don't respond to anything. You can kick them a thousand times. They won't move forward. You can pull on their bit and they just look like they don't care and they're so bored with you, but they are, they're in a state of learned helplessness. They have learned that their behavior has no effect on what is done to them and they might as well just retreat into a small, small little place inside their body and they're just not there anymore. So um, also that's proverbial. Of course, they can't actually retreat into themselves, but um, metaphorically speaking. So, um, oh, I hope you can't hear my neck. <laughs> that was gross. So what can happen when a horse is no longer kept in a state of learned helplessness is that they begin to come out of it and they can almost go through something way worse. And a lot of people, I think, when they first start clicker training really struggle with this because they're like, okay, well, my horse was really good before and then I started clicker training him and now he's rude, he's running all over me, he is just doing whatever he wants, he's not listening anymore, blah, blah, blah. So, um, it's kind of like, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of a metaphor. Just if you had like a really strict teacher and you had all these rules and, um, you know, you got used to that environment and you were very militant and then you changed classrooms and teachers and then your teacher is your new teacher is a very sweet pushover lady and 
Um, you know, she she kind of gives you rules, and, but she still gives you some choice in the matter. And when you choose wrong, there's not really any consequence. You just don't really get what you wanted, maybe. Um, and so in that circumstance, you're probably just going to do whatever the hell you want and what you couldn't do in the first classroom. Um, and gradually over time, as you get closer to this uh, new teacher and you learn that doing the right things are really, really reinforcing because you get, I don't know, Sunday parties or you get to go outside for extra recess or you get to wear a really cool pencil. I don't you can't wear a pencil. I don't know. Um, (laughs) But you get lots of good things when you do the right thing and you start establishing this reinforcement history where doing the right thing is reinforcing on its own as well as, you know, being able to get that the tangible reinforcers. Um, So then you begin to do it because you want to. And, um, you know, you have a good association with it. It feels good to do it. And doing the wrong things just aren't as reinforcing. So, um, that's essentially what happens with horses. So they, they have a little period where they might go a little crazy and they're like, uh, you're not keeping me in this little box anymore. You're not oppressing me. And also I don't like humans. They have not been nice to me, so I don't want anything to do with you. No, thanks. And, um, then they start expressing themselves. So it might not be the way that you would like them to, but they start. And then once the horse is behaving again, you're, you're on the right track. So a horse that's not behaving is likely in learned helplessness or some sort of pain loop. And, um, so when the horses come out of learned helplessness and start offering more behaviors again, that is, uh, when change can occur. What can also happen is what sounds like is happening to Mr. Newt here is that he's just very afraid. And I've dealt with a few horses like this at this point that were fine. And then when they weren't really being worked with, they just got really, really skittish. And then when I started working with them, it was like they were terrified to put a foot wrong for fear of punishment. And it's it's not like the horses that just start, you know, being like, hey, no thanks. I don't want to really work with you because humans are not good. I'm just not going to do what you ask. Um, these horses are more like, I'm genuinely afraid and, uh, I, I don't want to mess up because I'm afraid of what will happen if I do. And so that's what sounds like what's happening with Newt. So, and it's not to say that the horses that, you know, move away from you and just don't want to have anything to do with you aren't afraid. They just exhibit it differently. Um, and it's less obvious and it turns into what people are like, my horse just doesn't care and he's giving me the middle finger and he's being super rude. Um, but that's not exactly what is happening. So uh, what what do we do here? Um, this is where we get into McKenna's questions. So McKenna's first question is, what are my thoughts on how and when one should use sedation like Ace or Demosedan? So um, my thoughts specifically as someone who is not a veterinary professional. So this is my word of warning. I'm not a professional and you should always consult with your vet. My opinion is that it should be used when the horse is in some sort of emergency. So say this horse's toes are curling or he is three-legged lame and really needs to see a farrier. Use sedation if he's going to panic while he is having the farrier see him. Um, I also request that if I know that we have a particularly difficult horse that uh, won't exactly stand for the farrier, but hasn't, you know, maybe I haven't had time to work with them um, up to the level that I'd like for them to stand quietly for the farrier. And I also know our farriers tend to be a little bit more on the, um, keen to punish side when a horse does something quote unquote wrong. So if I know a horse is probably going to be a little bit more wiggly or a little bit more concerned, I go ahead and ask that they um, do a light sedation so that those horses just aren't stressed out the whole time and risking being uh, punished. So um, it's a tough call and it depends on the horse. Um, as always, it always depends on the horse. And like for me in those situations, it's like, okay, is the horse going to be more hurt by being sedated or more hurt by, um, 
you know, being in the situation where they're likely not going to be successful due to one thing or another, whether I haven't had time to train, I have made the choice not to train them, or, um, you know, they're just worried about the farrier. Um, so, and, you know, logistically for me, it's very hard to work with every single horse on this farm because we have like almost 30 horses. (laughs) So it's really difficult to make sure that everybody is super okay with the farrier, but you know, we're working on it slowly, but surely. Um, so like I said, my thoughts on how and when one should use sedation, I think you should use it when the horse is going to be in a state of distress and there is no other way around it. There's, you know, if you don't have time to tre- uh, prep training wise and it's an option, I would use it. Um, you know, like you said, for the vet or the fairy, if he's just going to be very worried and stressed out the whole time um, or putting or acting in a way that, you know, the other professionals are going to get irritated with or result to punishing, um, thus further damaging his understanding of humans and, you know, not feeling trusting around them, I would say go for it. Um, Another thing to consider on the front of working with those professionals is, um, you know, if If they don't already know, I would seriously have a conversation with them and, you know, because I know it can be overwhelming when you're talking to professionals to be like, please don't hit my horse. Um, But I would have a conversation with them because ultimately you are their client. Uh, You have hired them. It is not up to them to decide what to do with your horse in most circumstances. Obviously, like veterinary opinions, yes. But as far as the treatment of your horse goes, how they are handling and working with them and whether or not they are physically punishing them or not is your call. Um, I would say to them, just so you know, my horse is a kill pen rescue. I am working tirelessly to earn his trust and create a positive association with myself through using science-based training. I would really appreciate it if something goes wrong that you just take a step back and we can reassess and figure out how we can make him comfortable in a way that he is not going to react dangerously to anyone um, or get anybody hurt. But I would really ask that you not resort resort to punishment because I am working on a training protocol, but it is a work in progress and we are in an emergency situation. We must do these things. The end. Um, So that is something that you could say. Uh, it takes a lot of balls. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sugarcoat that. Uh, it's a scary thing to do. I hate, hate that. But um, that is something that we should all strive for, including myself. Um, okay. So next question: Is it possible for the clicker slash positive reinforcement way of training to be too slow for a horse's well-being? With Newt, it's a case of prioritizing physical health over mental health. It feels wrong to me to have to force him into situations that might compromise his mental well-being when positive reinforcement seems to fail me, generally due to his understandable distrust and my lack of knowledge. So this is fair. I mean, it like, like I was just saying, if you don't have time to clicker train him how to be comfortable and happy picking up every single one of his feet and holding them for increasing durations, uh, you know, especially with a horse that has um, some fear and trust issues, that can take a long time and it can be difficult. And especially if you're new to it, it can be really overwhelming and daunting. Um, So understandably, you're like, what do I do? Uh, Like, can I just use negative reinforcement? And I would really, really push you to try to stay diligent with it and you know, do your best to write out training plans and be consistent with it because you really can make a lot of progress in a short amount of time working with short five to 10 minute long training sessions and gradually building up and, you know, helping him get more comfortable with things like that. Also, if you can have somebody help you, like somebody at his head while you're at his feet. Um, And, you know, of course, I like to start all of this at liberty so the horse has Um, some freedom in the situation and the choice to leave that can be really empowering. And, um, you know, especially with a horse that has been abused, choice is very important in feeling confident and safe. I would also do it around other horses that he feels comfortable with to decrease his anxiety. I would also, um, you know, like you said, you're working with a vet, but I would really, really have him evaluated for things like ulcers because it's almost guaranteed. I would have his teeth checked um, because people that tend to be really rough on their horses and dump them in feedlots do not generally check their teeth. Um, Also, making sure he's on a low sugar 
diet, uh, low NSC diet, um, which stands for non-structural carbohydrate. You can get that percentage by adding the sugar and starch contents of your feed label. If your feed does not have that labeled, get a new feed. Um, having that content be lower will, um, also help in decreasing anxiety, decreasing body inflammation, and decreasing um, risk of ulcers. But it's almost assured that a horse that sounds this anxious or um, is this stressed all the time is going to be... A a horse that's been in a kill lot, period, is going to have ulcers. That is the worst place they can be. Um, So things like that, um, you know, really going to have to be diligent about... um, other things to consider. Yeah, just make sure he's comfortable everywhere. Um, seeing a chiropractor and a body worker might be out of the scope right now, but that could also really help. Um, oh my God, my neck is bothering me really bad today. Um, okay. So is it possible that it's too slow for a horse's well-being? Yes and no. Clicker training can be really slow in the beginning um, because it can take a while when the horse has a choice. it's a lot easier to, you know, force a horse to do something because you're scarier than the thing it's going to do or that it, you know, is afraid of or what have you. But, um, the horse isn't learning anything. Sorry, my (laughs) go to bed alarm went off. Um, but the horse isn't learning anything. The horse is just avoiding. Um, and I mean, of course they're learning, but they're learning to avoid the things that you are trying to get them to be comfortable with doing on a regular basis. So um, I, I would really um, advocate here for sticking with it as much as you can, because that is the thing about positive reinforcement. Like, let's take Zoe for an example. Miss Zobird it used to be so terrified of fly spray. Like, she would run for the hills anytime I broke out the fly spray. And um, when I started clicker training her, I didn't even think to work with that because I wasn't there yet in my clicker training. <laughs> like I just was like, oh, well, I'm a trainer to smile and step sideways and do all this fun stuff. And so I taught her a bunch of different things. And then when it came to working on the fly spray, she already knew what to do. And when I clicked her for standing with the fly spray, she was like, oh, okay, this is fine. And then she was totally comfortable with it. It just transferred. So I didn't really have to work on fly spraying her and getting her comfortable with it because she understood what I was asking of her and that this was a new puzzle, a new game that she could solve and she knew how to because she already knew the stand or mat work cue that I used to transition that. So, um, you know, it it just, it goes a really long way because it all builds on itself if you start off with a really solid foundation. And, you know, McKenna, I know it can be really hard when you're in a situation where it's like, okay, but I have to do all of these things. And he, like, I'm not there yet in my knowledge and he's not there yet in his training, but he has to have his feet done. He has to see the vet. He has to have his teeth done, yada, yada, yada. Um, so it can, um, it can be difficult. And at the end of the day, you have to do what you have to do for the horse's well-being. Um, as far as like his feet thing go, the more he can be outside, if it's possible for him to be out 24 seven, that is absolutely the move that I would make. Um, it's way better for horses to be outside anyway, especially when struggling with feet issues. Um, the hooves work like kind of like plungers, (laughs) um, for blood flow. So when a horse steps down, the blood pumps down into the feet And then when the horse steps up, it like sucks up all the blood and sends it everywhere else in the body. So it it helps the flow of things. And when a horse is stagnant, circulation is um, significantly impaired and it doesn't help them wear their feet, um, you know, wear it off naturally, which um, could also reduce the amount of frequency or um, like increase the amount of time between trims. Um, something else that we're going to do is put some flatter stones, uh, and maybe some pea gravel around our, uh, water troughs because A, they're quite muddy and B, the horses, um, you know, aren't wearing their hooves as much as they were at the other farm because there's more grass here. Um, while they're traveling more and moving around because they have a lot of space, they're not really wearing their feet down. So we're going to put out some, um, strategic (laughs) foot, uh, or, uh, oh my God, footing, 
ground, whatever, uh, for some self-trimming stations so the horses can kind of break off their own hooves uh, like they would in the wild. But yeah, so that might be something else that you could look into is self-trimming stations and pea gravel, if that's something you can do. Also, if people aren't allowing you to take your horse out, I can't believe I didn't touch on this a second ago. Um, If it's possible, move. Don't be there anymore. That's ridiculous. The horse doesn't need to just stay inside because everybody's afraid of him. I can't tell you, like, when I was 14, we had horses that I had no business leading because they were quote-unquote dangerous or hot, and uh, I was expected to bring them in and out of the barn. There was never a horse that came inside that was not allowed to be handled by other people or just had to suffer and stay inside because the barn owners were scared of it. Like, do something to help this horse and accommodate it. Like, don't just torture it because it's struggling. That makes me so angry. And McKenna, I I doubt that, like, this is something that you've had a say in. But if you can find a different place, find a different place. Ask on Facebook. Ask on Instagram. Look around in your area. Call around. See if there's something that you can do because that is absurd to... I mean, like, I understand as a human being afraid of a horse and being uncomfortable leading them. But there are so many things that you can do other than just stick the horse in a stall and be like, I'm not touching it. Deal with it yourself. Um, Yeah, that's just, that's being a bad barn owner um, and not even trying to work with you to help the horse. That's just frustrating to me. Um, But I'm glad that you are the one that is trying to advocate for him. But I would... uh, I would really seek out a new a new place. Um, ideally, somewhere that he could be out 24-7 with friends. <laughs> and that will help his anxiety lower. Um, okay. So, answering the question here. Yes, it's possible for clicker training to be too slow at first. I, th- I do believe genuinely that once a horse is pretty clicker savvy, everything else goes way faster. Like I was saying with Zoe, I didn't really have to work that hard on the fly spray. And um, I'll give you another example with her. Um, It took me a really long time to teach her hip targeting because it was really confusing for both of us to figure out how I needed to communicate that to her. And by hip targeting, I mean, I hold out my hand and she swings her hip until her haunches, like her hip butt area is in my hand, which sounds weird to say. My horse's ass is in my hand. Fun. Um, Okay, anyway. uh, So um, when I taught her that, I also wanted to teach her how to... um, I always always confuse these two for some reason. Side pass, leg yield, whatever the one is that where they go directly sideways. I think that's a side pass. Yes. I always forget those. It's side pass, shoulder four, and uh, leg yield. I don't know why I can't remember which is which. It's just very confusing. I think I know the difference. Like, I can picture it in my head. Couldn't describe it to you, though. It's something about tracks, whatever. Um, Anyway, so having her walk directly sideways, crossing over outside foot in front um, was a super easy transition because, um, you know, I would target her hip and then I would hold out my hand by her shoulder and just kind of move them back towards myself And then she just kind of guessed and then stepped sideways with her front as well. And then I would click for that. And then I taught her how to walk sideways super quick because she knew how to hip target. So she already was thinking sideways. And she was like, what if I tried my front too? And then, you know, we have a new behavior. So, and I mean, I did that. I remember that I taught her to move sideways at 10 p.m. at night in the dark in my Crocs and shorts with my like recently showered hair. And I just got a wild hair and I was like, I need to go outside and train my horse how to walk sideways. And so I did that at 10 p.m. at night and it took 10 minutes. So like it, it, it works, but you have to establish that foundation. And like I've said a thousand times, it can be difficult in a situation where you're combating all these issues. But I really think that if you stay consistent with it um, and, you know, you might use something like hay pellets, uh, like Timothy hay pellets, something a uh, lower value reinforcer. Um, if you want to use um, your alfalfa as a higher value reinforcer, so you can feed them a lot. Um, and yeah, so 
those are those are my my thoughts. Also, study as much as you can. Learn as much as possible. Okay, trying to crank through these because we got quite a few more. Uh, when, in your opinion, should a professional clicker trainer get involved with a struggling horse hands-on, not just advising, col- consulting for the owner? I've been planning to send him to a clicker trainer I found to restart him due to my inexperience with abused horses, but they live several hours away, so I would not get to see him as often as I would like to ensure his training meets my expectations for his well-being and safety. I've had issues with several p- trainers in the past who could not be trusted, so I'm a bit nervous. Okay, so my thoughts on this are, when should you send a clicker trainer to get involved with a struggling horse? Um, I would say if you feel like you are in danger and that you're overfaced and you're not going to be able to do the horse, um, justice in the situation, um, and that it would be better if somebody else got him a little bit further while you take the time to learn and also that you're willing to go learn from the other trainer, then that is the time. Um, I, I, I mean, if you can get a professional clicker trainer involved, period, you should probably do it (laughs) just because, uh, you know, it's just an awesome opportunity for you and your horse to learn. Um, but you know, sending the horse off can be difficult for a variety of reasons. You know, you're moving them locations again. Um, but it sounds like your horse is already not in a very fantastic situation at present. So if that's kind of the stepping stone you need, you know, send him away to a trainer and then oopies, you just don't come back. (laughs) You paid your last board and now you're done. Um, You know, that might be something to consider, which is probably what I would do. (laughs) Um, And just be like, yeah, I think I'm just going to keep him with this trainer. I've actually moved. Goodbye. (laughs) Um, So yeah. Uh, as I, I would go ahead and do it. It sounds like he's really struggling and you're struggling and, um, you know, you're doing the best you can, but when you're not a pro, you're not a pro. And this horse sounds like he's in kind of a difficult situation. So if you think it would be beneficial to send him to a pro, um, and move him along faster, give him the time and dedication that he needs to get him, um, you know, progressing quicker, then do it. Um, As for vetting an individual, I would, um, you know, you could go on the Clicker Training Horses Facebook group and, you know, maybe type in their names, search them, see if anybody's mentioned them or their posts. I would browse around on their social media and see what content they're putting out and make sure that it aligns with your values and beliefs. Um, Additionally, I would also see if you could set up a time with them to have a phone call. That's what um, my clients have done with me. You know, we just jump on the phone and I discuss my values and my plans. And, you know, when you talk to them, you could ask them to write up a training plan for you and literally write out everything that they're going to do with the horse. Um, And then you can kind of sign off on that and be like, yes, I consent to this. You may do this with my horse. And, you know, make it clear that you want to be involved and you, this is your baby. (laughs) He has been abused and you want him, you know, you want training done right by him. And you are allowed to ask that they provide you with a detailed document of what they're going to do with your horse. Um, You know, and they might not be able to say like, okay, well, I'm going to do step by step to work on X issue because they might not know that there's this issue, but um, you can request that. Um, they keep a training log of training plans and progress notes and things like that, that they send to you and let you know how it's going. Um, you know, things like that would be helpful for you and for them. Uh, I find that it makes my training go better when I keep journals. Um, so things like that, maybe, um, Yeah, I would just, I would have a conversation with them and lay it all out and be like, look, this horse has had a rough go of it and I really need somebody who knows what they're doing. Do you feel comfortable working with the horse in this situation? Please let me know. Um, Also, if you haven't already, there is, uh, like I mentioned, the Clicker Training Horses Facebook page. There is a uh, trainer map uh, with, you know, like it's a world map that has trainers pinned in locations where clicker trainers are it's also available on my website under the equine edu tab on positive reinforcement there is um you can scroll down and you'll find that map there um and you can look to see if there are others that you might like to reach out to um but yeah as far as them being several hours away and you wouldn't like to get 
to see him as often. Um, I can say that I have done this before for someone. They have a client sent me their horse and I worked with the horse and, um, I believe they lived about three hours away. And when they drove down, they could only come every other weekend and we would work with the horse and she did very well and they both learned together. And, you know, obviously it's not ideal. Ideally, we would be able to work together every session. So, you know, the owner is learning from me, knows exactly what I'm doing with the horse and is then able to replicate it. Um, it's not ideal to do one lesson every two weeks, but it is what it is. And also I expect the owners to be learning on the side. Um, and I give them material at the end too, just like if I find that there are any things that they might be missing or that they could benefit from reading, I give them, um, you know, some lists like that. But, um, yeah, so maybe you could work out something like that where you'd be able to come see him and do a couple sessions here and there. Um, yeah. So hopefully that helps assuage some of your concern. That's just what I would do. And as a trainer, um, that is, that's what I would be okay with. And I would not be offended by somebody being like, could you just like give me some peace of mind that, you know, he's not going to enter a bad situation. It's, you know, it's not that I, I expect you to be a bad trainer. It's just that I've dealt with it a lot in the past and I really, really love this horse. And I just, I want to make sure that everything is going to go according to plan. So it might just assuage my helicopter mom ways, you know, that's, I resort to self-deprecation a lot. Um, okay. <laughs> Probably not the best thing in the world, but you know. Um, okay. Number four, I would love to hear your opinion on the idea that a horse could be too far gone to train. I have been told by several people that he may be too far gone as far as his ability to take on training and ultimately learn to function as a relatively normal, handleable horse. Logically to me, especially seeing as he's improved so much lately, I feel that once we get past basic level handling and management training, he will be able to comfortably reintegrate as a typical riding horse over time and with extensive training, of course. Is it possible for a horse to be too traumatized regarding more specific behaviors like perhaps grooming or brushing to be counter-conditioned? Um, example cannot ever be brush or groomed post trauma despite extensive training. So, um, it's hard to say definitively that no horse ever can, um, you know, or that there might be some horses or no horse ever can be trained past, um, you know, with extensive training. I, I'm confused, but you, I think you know what I'm saying. Um, so... I, d I don't think so. Uh, that said, a horse can require more time than a human is either capable or willing to give. Um, I have known a few of those that the horse has been in a situation where they need a lot of consistency and a lot of help and the owner has not been in a position to supply that or is not, is simply not willing to. And in which case, you know, that that's a different story, but it sounds like McKenna, you are willing to give the horse that time or send the horse to somebody who can. Um, so what I would do is, um, you know, try not to look at it as, is he too far gone? But like, you know, okay, maybe this is one of those circumstances where I just say it's, it's keep a training journal. If, if, you know, you're going to keep working with him and you're not ready to send him off just yet, start keeping a training journal. Um, and you know, maybe your first entry is to write down every behavior and exactly how he was when you first got him and write down the horse he is now. And hopefully seeing that on paper will help you realize how far you really have brought him along and how big of a leap that change was for him and how much he really does trust you and how much he's improved. Because it can be really hard when you get, it's kind of like, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever raised like a kitten or a puppy and, you know, you see them every day. So you don't really notice much change, but then your friend comes over that hasn't seen them in two weeks and they're like, oh my God, they're huge. Um, the same thing can go for training. You know, you get used to seeing what your horse is like every day and you don't notice how different they really are. So, um, you know, when you're working on behaviors, if you keep a training journal and you're able to write out everything and make it very clear to yourself what you're doing, what you're working on, where you're starting and where you're ending, um, you know, you'll be able to flip back and look through that and be like, oh my God, wait, we actually are making progress when you feel like you might not be. 
Um, I don't think that there are horses that um, can't learn to enjoy being groomed, um, especially if it's, um, you know, because grooming is something that horses do to one another. And so it's, it's a pleasurable social thing for horses at baseline. So maybe you just start with like scratching. Um, and of course, this is assuming that the horse has been treated for ulcers and is no longer in any sort of pain. Um, because if the horse is body sore or has ulcers or is on an inflammatory type diet, um, you know, his body might hurt. And then that might be, you might be working uphill there and you can't untrain pain. So if the horse is experiencing pain when you touch him, of course he's not going to like grooming. So it's really important that you make sure that you've rolled those things out as well before you like really dive into that. Otherwise you're probably just, you know, kind of adding to the problem, even though he might be getting treats <laughs> while you're doing it. Um, so I, I, I can't say for sure that there are horses that, um, you know, won't ever learn to enjoy being brushed or cared for in that way, but I, I don't think so. I think that every horse can learn, and I'm pretty, pretty confident in that, that they can get over that. Because it's really just, like you say, counter conditioning, habituating, uh, learning a new association. And, you know, like I said earlier, I would do all of this at liberty, where the horse is comfortable with other, you know, horses around as much as you can. Um, I would not do it in a place where the horse is like super confined or isolated because that can spike the anxiety. Um, so if you're able, I would do it out in the pasture with your horse and his herd mates. But if that is dangerous because of, you know, the other herd mates or your horse's behavior, you can set up like a reverse round pin situation out there and, um, you know, where you just kind of put like stakes out and a rope or some poles or what have you. And, um, uh, then put you guys in there. So then you have a round pin to work in and the other horses won't bother you as much. Um, mm, burp again. Um, but that way you are setting up the environment for success and the horse is not going to be stressed to start with. And then you can start working on those things. And then you can gradually work into areas where maybe he's isolated or maybe he's not in a place that he's super comfortable being in, like maybe the barn or whatever. Um, so I, I don't think so. I don't think horses can be too far gone to train, but I do think, um, that humans might not have as much time as the horse needs to overcome certain issues. And also it's like a thing of picking your battles too. Like grooming, obviously that's something that you need to do. Um, but for Zoe, like, could I train her to go back to, you know, showing? Like, I'm not going to jump her ever again because of her hawks, but I could do dressage shows on her. But am I going to? Probably not. Um, because is it worth... Because she gets very stressed out when she goes off property and and show environments and things like that. So, um, you know, it could be different with the kissing spine. But, like, is it really worth it? Like, do I want to show that badly that I need to work through all of these issues to make her super comfortable with showing and being in that environment? Probably not. I know that Zoe has a home for life here. Uh, if something tragic were to happen to me, Sunny will take her and she will live out the rest of her days here. Um and that is just that. So uh, there's really no need for her to know how to go to shows and stuff. And if, you know, another individual ever was to acquire her, they're not going to show her because her hawks are god awful. So, and by god awful, I mean, would require lots of money to make her jumpable. And she wouldn't last. She would burn out real fast. But anyway, that's, that's what I'm talking about, about like pick your battles, you know, is this horse that you know, you're wondering if is too far gone to train ever going to be a horse that you can like, you know, take and be a competitive eventer on? Maybe not. But d is that do you need to do that? I mean, sure, you could probably work up to it. And in theory, it can be done, but it would require a lot of training. And, you know, to me, I'm like, is it worth it? I, just, I can enjoy my horse not showing. And that's not for everyone. But um, that's that's why we begin to collect them. <laughs> You know, you have one that can go to shows and is comfortable and extroverted enough to do things like that and others that won't. 
Um, I'm hoping that will be Azula for me. Uh, fingers crossed she doesn't get much bigger and then hits a super growth spurt after she's past the age to go to the track. Please, dear God. <laughs> um, okay. Number five, do you think it's ethical to try and fix a horse in a state of post-trauma recovery and continue to try to reintegrate the horse into a normalized way of functioning? Or should we instead try to find a way to comfortably retire them permanently or temporarily and see some ensure the majority of reintegration training as a way to respect them in their present situation? Do you have an experience or know anyone with experiencing um, with experience managing abused horses with positive reinforcement and how they did it? Um, so I think it is less ethical to um, cease reintegration training. Um, I, I love the idea of respecting them in their present situation. And like, obviously, by reintegration training, my, my understanding of that is using positive reinforcement to help the horse get comfortable with things that it's uncomfortable with or afraid of, um, not forcing them to do stuff. But I think it is less ethical to leave a horse with ulcers and painful feet and sharp teeth in the field, assuming that this horse has those issues. I have no idea. But it, you know, if a horse is dangerous and afraid, you know, do you just turn them out into a field and let them be dangerous and afraid or do you train them? Um, if like, like I was just talking about with Zoe, as owners, we have to consider, you know, the unfortunate possibility that we might not be around. We could get into a tragic accident and then what would happen to our horses? So this is not something that I need to give everybody a panic attack about, but, you know, you want your horse to be successful wherever it is in life, and that involves some having a first aid kit, so to speak, you know, an emergency situation preparation training situation <laughs> um, where the, you know, you can know that the horse can go to a a, you know, a traditional situation and be okay because they know what the vet is, they know what the farrier is, and they will not get beaten and abused because they understand those things. They're not going to live in pain because they're going to be amenable to those things and they will allow their feet to be done or their teeth to be done, what have you. Um, so I think that doing as much as you can to at least get basic care okay is fine. You know, if if you think that riding him is going to be too much for him, maybe that's not something that you guys do together. Maybe you just do a bunch of groundwork and you become like a really awesome Liberty team or something. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it depends on the horse. It depends on what you want, um, and what the horse wants. And you're just going to have to figure that out together. Um, but I do think that at least basic and emergency related behaviors of healthcare and management, all of that, those need to be covered for sure so that the horse is okay to be handled and will be cared for. As far as anyone with experiencing experience managing abused horses with positive reinforcement and how they did it, um, I have a little bit of experience with it, not as much as probably necessary. Um, Adele Shaw down in Austin, Texas has quite a bit of experience. Oh my God, why can't I speak? Experience with that. And, uh, my buddy Kane Meyer in, uh, God, I forgot where they live somewhere in California. <laughs> my brain, it's just not, it's not coming up with it. I believe it starts with an S. That's all I've got for you. Um, I know they do. Um, uh, there are just so many, I mean, I'm sure most of them have, and you can, you can ask in that clicker training horses group, Hey, any clicker trainers in X area, worked with abused horses. Does anybody have any resources on that? Um, can somebody help me? Is there podcast episodes on it? Blah, blah, blah. Um, those things. Yep. Okay. Number six, I have also been regularly listening to Warwick Schiller's podcast and have been impressed by his new method of training. I've been curious to try it, but I know it contradicts a lot of the positive reinforcement I've learned recently, which brings me to my next question. So question number six, part A, <laughs> can you please clarify how combined reinforcement works? Okay, so since I'm an hour and eight minutes into this episode, I am going to unfortunately cop out a little bit on this question and um, probably defer to the series that I did with Kane Meyer uh, on riding with positive reinforcement. Um, we talked a little bit about it there. Um but combined reinforcement is a tricky topic because you can run into the circumstance of the poisoned cue where the 
uh, it's always so long to explain. I know I explained it in one of my episodes um, in the past, but um, the nutshell version is the animal doesn't know what to expect, and then the cue becomes sort of a, an aversive stimulus because they don't know if they're going to get rewarded or punished. Um, because in order to use negative reinforcement, you sort of have to introduce and or apply an aversive in order to take it away. So you're punishing what you don't like. Maybe say the horse is, you know, walking with his, uh, he's just walking and you want the horse to stop. So you're in order to stop, you have to pull on the reins. Um, and you know, in traditional training that, is not the end goal. You start with that. And if the horse doesn't stop, you might pull a little bit harder and a little bit harder, or you might just leave the pressure consistently until the horse figures out how to stop. Um, So you are punishing. It sounds like a strong word, but you are punishing the walk. And then when the horse stops, you release. So you're reinforcing the stop. Um, So, and then eventually over time, the pull becomes a cue. So the horse will hopefully learn to stop at a light pull on the reins if the training is done well. Um, and often it's not, (laughs) I have been guilty of this in the past as well. Um, so a lot of people might pull on the rein and then click and treat, um, which is just our negative reinforcement with the cherry on top, which is not good combined reinforcement. Um, I think Shelby Dennis is a pretty good example of someone who uses combined reinforcement. Um, she is SD Equus on social media platforms. Um, Georgia Bruce is also somebody to look at who does combined reinforcement. Um, she is click with horses, I believe on most platforms. She's really, really awesome. Does like upper level dressage, um, and competes in para events and does clicker training amazingly with combined reinforcement. But, um, how I would use combined reinforcement, um, in a scenario with like stopping a horse is I would probably, you know, use, I don't know if it's more of a tactile cue though or not. <laughs> like, um, I guess what I would do is, you know, first teach the horse on the ground, you know, maybe we're walking and I apply a little pressure backwards on the rein. And when the horse, you know, half halts or like hesitates a bit, I would click and treat for that and release the pressure at the same time. Um, and I would likely be doing this with a clicker savvy horse already. And, you know, a clicker savvy horse is probably going to be more motivated by the positive reinforcement, the treat. And they're like, oh, this is the puzzle. I, and is more, you know, of course they half halted and hesitated because of the pressure on the reins because that's a natural reaction, but then they begin to do it because of the positive reinforcement outcome. That is one example. Um, it's, it's very muddy. Um, and I would refer you to my website again, the positive reinforcement tab. There is a section explaining the quadrants. And I believe, I think it's in the glossary section. And if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, it discusses why the quadrants aren't perfect squares anymore and how they all overlap. And that might help this make a little bit more sense. Uh, cause I don't have time to deep dive into all of that. Um, okay. So part B is it possible in the clicker training world to both use negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement together ethically? Um, The answer is yes. In some clicker training (laughs) worlds, um, I I do occasionally mix. I typically kind of am just a, like my horses that I ride traditionally for um, my boss just kind of get positive reinforcement for certain things. Um, because they are traditional horses. She would like them ridden and trained normally, but we do it in a very kind, slow way, um, using as much non-escalating as is possible. Um, and she's very big on clicker training and treats now anyway. So it's, we're working on it, but, um, some, some groups are like on Facebook and some individuals that are clicker trainers are through and through purists. And, uh, that's fine. I mean, if you are in a situation where that is available to you, do it, go for it. Absolutely. But if you're not, uh, like 90% of us, then you might have to use some negative reinforcement here and there. Um, because most people are in boarding or barn situations or might not own their horse. And so, you know, is it the most ethical Maybe not, probably not, um, given the Lima hierarchy, least intrusive, minimally aversive um, hierarchy of uh, behavior modification, I believe, done by uh, Susan Friedman. So, um, 
uh, yes and no. <laughs> it depends on who you ask is probably a more accurate, uh, more accurate answer. Um, but do I believe so at this present moment? Yes. In my earlier episodes? No. And maybe in the future? Yes. Or maybe no. At present? Kind of. <laughs> Um, I think that, I think that you can be a good trainer and have a good relationship with your horse, be fair, humane, and ethical by using both, but it depends on how, um, are you being ethical? Like, this is kind of what I would ask myself in your situation. Like you're in an emergency situation where this horse needs medical attention. Are you being ethical by waving off the medical attention and trying to train him with positive reinforcement, even though he's in pain? Or would you be more ethical to be as kind as you can, but force him into situations where he receives the medical attention that he needs, even though he might be a little emotionally uncomfortable, but ultimately it is for the betterment of his health. And then you can really pick up your training after that. You cannot train through pain. So in my opinion, you would be more ethical to choose a second option um, that doesn't give the free pass to just be a dick to the horse, but um, you know get done what needs to be done in the kindest, most humane way possible. Um, but yeah. Okay. So part C, after listening to Warwick's latest podcast with Dr. Sarah Schulte, Schulte, I have been terribly curious about what your thoughts are on the idea of humans deciding on a particular way slash method of training based on their past traumatic experience. Per her example, mostly unrelated to horses. Has that been true for you in choosing positive reinforcement? What are your thoughts on using energy pressure when training horses, not physically touching them as Warwick often demonstrates? Um, so there's a lot of questions in this one. I wasn't really sure how to break it up, but um, cause I, <laughs> I broke it up into different sections. She didn't label it as part a or question six, part a, that was me. Um, I have to make it make sense to my brain. So, um, I actually have listened to that episode. It's been a hot minute since I did, but I remember really, really enjoying that episode and I'm going to have to go back and re-listen to it. Um, there were some things in the episode I remember being like, eh, but I, I, I really love a lot of what Warwick's guests have to say. Warwick. Sorry. I know I always mispronounce it. It looks like Warwick <laughs> and my brain says Warwick. I know it's Warwick. 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 I'm just not Australian. I I can't say it correctly. Um, I'm working on it. I'll get there. Um, Okay. So yeah, Uh, I I do absolutely believe that that is a possibility. I think that humans can absolutely um, be attracted to a way of training based on their past trauma. Like I know for me, I really um, like there was a deep seated part of me that felt really wrong about uh, the way that I trained traditionally, especially when I was younger and had a really short fuse and was really impatient. And when my horses acted up, I would take my frustration out on them by, you know, running the bit through their teeth or whipping them or spurring them, you know, just doing awful things. Um, and a lot of the time it would result in me, uh, getting off and sitting on the ground and crying. But, um, there was a part of me at one point, especially when I was a teenager and I was kind of going through my rebellious stage, you know, every, I hated everyone and was angry all the time. Um, (laughs) which you guys might not have known on Instagram because I was happy go lucky Miss Positivity Jill, but, uh, there were some dark days in there. Um, but I grew up, um, and I love my parents dearly, but they did tend to be a little bit authoritarian sometimes. My dad was a police officer and sometimes I felt like a perp. (laughs) Um, so I, I had a lot of control in certain areas, but I didn't have a lot of control in others. And so having an animal that literally represents freedom, power, grace, all of that, and being able to control it was kind of a power trip, especially like with Zoe um, and Bo. They weren't particularly easy horses to ride and work with. And when they would demonstrate that through, you know, tossing their heads or rearing or being generally difficult, um, you know, it felt good to put them in their place and be like, no animal, you must listen to me. I am the one that's making these decisions and it's my voice that matters. That felt good. I will not lie. I'm not proud of it. And I don't love that for me, but I understand. And I understand why I felt that way and why it was rewarding to be in that position, but it is cringy and hurts my feelings a lot for my horses that I treated them that way. Um, 
anyway, so, um, yeah, I think it can absolutely influence it. Like, for me, when I felt like I didn't have a lot of control in my life, exerting control uh, very much in a way that I felt like was being exerted on me. Obviously, my parents were not running their, my a bit through my teeth, but, um, you know, and just just not allowing any other alternative, um, it was, it was satisfying in a way. Um, it satisfied that need and desire for control, um, which I absolutely have as somebody who just struggles a lot with control and letting go. So, um, as far as now, why I train the way I train, um, I think it's more of a cognitive decision than, um, you know, something that's like driven by my childhood or past traumas, because I don't know, I wasn't, I wasn't really raised in a positive reinforcement way, I guess. I mean, like, obviously I was privileged, very privileged and got a lot of things that I wanted. Um, but it wasn't necessarily like a direct result of my behavior or actions. Um, like, I don't know, it's complicated to explain, and this is not an episode about my childhood, but um, I, I do think that it, it's an interesting thing to consider, and you guys listening, including McKenna, um, I'm sure McKenna has already reflected on it, actually, but um, if you're listening, you know, think about your history and, like, you know, maybe some your some of your trauma and how that affects your relationship with your horses. It's a good, it's a good journaling prompt if you're into that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to say. I think um, for me, knowledge has always been power. And when I know more then I can make better decisions, I've always been somebody who's kind of paralyzed by, uh, having too many options. And, uh, the more information I have, the easier it is for me to make a decision. So, um, maybe that's why I'm really into positive reinforcement and science-based work because it, uh, it makes sense to me. And there is evidence to support why it's the right decision. So maybe that's it. I don't know. I could psychoanalyze all day, but I, I do think it's really interesting. Um, yeah. I, um, so what are my thoughts on using energy pressure when training horses, not physically touching them? Um, I, you know, I, I really, really do admire Warwick as a, as a trainer. And I think that for people who are like totally not interested in positive reinforcement and, you know, maybe you're listening to this podcast and you're like, I love hearing about the way other people train, but I'm so not doing this with my horse. Clicker training is weird. Um, if you're in that camp, I highly recommend, uh, watching and listening to Warwick's work because he is probably the best traditional trainer out there that I'm aware of at least. And I listen to his podcast pretty avidly because I really enjoy what he has to say. And I, um, think that, um, you know, using quote unquote energy pressure can be, um, preferable to using physical pressure. Um, I do think that energy pressure can, not saying that this is something that Warwick does specifically, but I have seen trainers who say that they're using energy are using fear. Um, you know, they might stomp their foot at their horse or kind of like juke them, fake them out and like, you know, move towards them quickly, um, as if they're gonna, like, run forward at them or whatever, um, and the horse, like, jumps out of the way or moves faster, increases whatever, um, speed they're going, um, and that's not necessarily, like, I raised my energy, so the horse is raising his energy or I'm blocking him with my energy, it's, like, you're scaring him (laughs) and that's what's happening, um, and that's not necessarily, um, something that I'm into. Um, and I think, I don't know how to say this. Um, because I I really do believe that there is a place for calling parts of training energy and, or like a method or application or whatever. Um, I do think that there is some level of woo woo spiritual energy connection and influence that we can affect on horses without touching them or moving towards them or things like that. Um, horses are very sensitive and, you know, there have been plenty of times that I haven't done things and have gotten a response out of a horse. And, you know, it could have been like a micro movement or something that I wasn't aware of, but it was just a thought, but it was subtle enough for the horse because horses communicate very subtly. So 
you know, I think that that's something to consider for sure. Um, I also noticed that, um, like I've really had to concentrate on this and Warwick's podcast has actually helped me with this a lot, um, over the past year or two, especially after I started clicker training and stuff and like getting really good about making, um, you know, decisions in the moment, analyzing behavior, figuring out what would work best, blah, blah, blah. And also like a lot of mindfulness work and how to regulate my own anxiety and bring my energy level down. Because a lot of the time I would just go out to horses with this like gung-ho, okay, I'm going to catch them. I'm going to ride. I've got five horses to ride today. I got to move, 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 move. And the horses are like, oh, you're bringing a lot to me here. It's kind of like, I don't know if you guys know those people that just like when you're near them, their leg is bouncing, their eyes kind of twitching, and they're twirling a finger between their uh, fingers and they're just like moving around really erratically and you're you just kind of like lose your breath around them because you're like oh my god <laughs> you're stressing me out that happens with horses and I think that that is probably more the way that I understand energy around horses it's like a vibe you know <laughs> um but uh because I've definitely seen horses that are totally fine react to you know, that are normally very calm and then somebody that's kind of erratic and bouncing off the walls enters the picture and they're like, uh, I don't know what's going on. And they suddenly get kind of squirrely and they're, you know, a little bit more spooky and, uh, high energy. So I think yes. And what I was saying about myself is like, I've recently been working with a lot of babies and young horses and like with Teddy, you know, Teddy is phenomenal to begin with. So there's not really a lot that I have to do, but, um, and Archer's kind of the same way. So I don't know how much credit I'm really supposed to give myself here. I would have to ask them, but they've been in a lot of scary situations lately, relatively speaking. Um, we just moved farms. Um, and let's take Archer, for example. So Archer, when we first got him, he was kind of working out an abscess. So we just kind of let him, grow his feet out and go barefoot and get more comfortable. And then we moved him farms. So we hadn't worked with him at all at this point. Um, so then we moved farms, we got him out here and, um, he was out here for like three or four weeks. And then I wrote Teddy one day and then I just kind of talking to Sonny about Archer and I was like, he's just the sweetest, so chill horse. And I wonder, I just want to know how he is. And we were like, well, let's see if, let's see how we feel about him today. So we pulled him out, brought him in the cross ties. He was perfectly fine in the cross ties, got him tacked up. Wonderful. Took him to the arena, lunged him. He was fantastic. And mind you, we have a giant domed cover indoor, covered indoor arena now. And it's very scary looking. Like if I were a horse, I would be like, no thanks. Um, he walked right in there. Granted it's in his field, but he walked right in there. He was fine. He lunged like he was an old pro at it. Um, and then I, you know, I just did walk trot in one canter circle just cause I was like, is he a bucker? And he was totally fine. So I just hopped on him. But, um, like all of that was a lot for a young horse. Arguably, if it hadn't been Archer, I probably wouldn't have gotten on him the first day. Um, but it's Archer and he's so, he's just the bestest boy. And Teddy's the same way. I didn't even lunge Teddy before I took him in there. And the, that arena is not in his field. But my point in saying all of this is that those horses had every reason to be very freaky, outy, and scared. And, um, you know, at one point, um, Oh, I think it was Teddy that I had in the cross ties and he was moving around a little bit because there was a, a new horse up there that he hadn't met yet, um, that we were working with as well. And, uh, he, he was just kind of wiggly and she was like, okay, I need you to pick up the pace a little bit. He's, he's moving around a lot. You need to like get a move on so we can get, a, get him out of these cross ties. And I was like, I disagree. I think we need to slow down and spend more time in the cross ties. And, you know, if he gets, if he gets to where he's like really not okay, and I, I feel like he's going to go over threshold, then, then, you know, we'll tack him up outside, um, or somewhere where he's more comfortable, but he's not really there. He's just kind of like taken some steps here and there. Um, and you know, we're both thoroughbred people, so we're both very sensitive to that sort of thing. And I was like, I think that we need to slow down and give him some snackies, tell him it's okay. Because if I'm zipping around him and trying to get him tacked up as fast as possible, A, he's not going to learn that cross ties. We might have to spend some time in them. And B, um, he's, 
it's going to stress him out because I'm going to be moving quickly. My heart rate's going to go up. I am going to start smelling like stress and sweat and ah anxiety. And I, I think we just need to bring it down and make it a calm, relaxing, rewarding experience for him. And that's exactly what we did. And he was so good. And he was so fine. And he stood there for every last bit of it. And we gave him lots of treats and snacks. And he was a good boy. And Archer was the same way. But before I got on him, I had to, like, really center myself because I was nervous, of course. I'm like, I don't know this horse hardly at all. I mean, I know him on the ground, but I don't know what he's like under saddle. I've never seen anybody ride him. And this is my first time in a completely new place. For all intents and purposes, this is a very bad idea. (laughs) Um, Did I set him up for success? Probably not. But at this it's archer like he's so good (laughs) and so before i got on him i i just kind of walked him around the arena and i was working on my breathing lowering my energy watching him and anytime he got a little bit worried or his energy raised i would work to lower mine in whatever way and then give him a moment to bring himself back down before we did anything else um And then when I got on him, we did the same thing and he was brilliant. And I think that that is a huge, huge factor of energy with horses. Um, When you're zipping around and you're nervous and you're anxious and you've got an agenda or you're like, I have to do everything perfectly or it's going to get screwed up or uh, I'm in a hurry today. So the horse, you better cooperate or, you know, whatever. When you have that anxiety, I mean, these are herd animals that are designed to sense anxiety literally around them. Like... I mean, Warwick, this is something that he talks about a lot in his podcast that, you know, horses don't even have to pick up their heads and look around to alert the horses around them that something might be happening. You know, they tense some muscles before they even lift their head and everybody else is ready to bolt Um, because that is their language of communication. Because if they, if it took them so long to have these big, elaborate, I'm a little bit alarmed expressions, then they would all die because they, the predators would get to them. So it has to be quick and efficient and subtle. So when, like, it's, I think it's ridiculous to think that our behavior has to be loud and obnoxious for the horses to notice. You know how they say horses can smell fear? I don't know that that's true, but they can definitely see it and sense it in your body language. So that is sort of my opinion on that. Um, and I hope that that explains my my view on the difference in energy types. Um, I am fading fast here. I am very hungry and I smell very bad. I need to shower. So I'm going to crack through these last couple of questions, but I'm still probably going to end up talking for a century. Because let's be honest, it's me. That is a monster, by the way, that I'm drinking at 10.51 at night. Thanks, ADHD. You make me able to sleep after drinking that. Um, Okay. Section D, is it advisable and or ethical to train a horse with a conflicted, angry, irritated mindset? Um, I'm assuming this is the human that has this mindset. Um, I would say it's not advisable. Ethical is more like, are you going to harm the horse if you're in this mindset? Because if you're still an efficient trainer when you're in this mindset, then I'm sure it's ethical. But is it ethical to yourself? Are you doing yourself a disservice by acting inauthentically? Or are you actually healing yourself and then thus making it ethical? Who knows? Um, that's more of uh, a philosophical question that I think is more individual and depends on the circumstance. But in general, I would not advise it because uh, for the aforementioned reasons of the energy situation, your vibe, if you will, um, you can put off a disconcerting vibe to the horse. Uh, That's, this is my most scientific podcast ever. (laughs) Um, But I, I think that it's best that if you're in that mindset, if you can't get yourself to calm down and get to a better headspace, that maybe we just skip training for today Um, or just go hang out with them and relax and don't expect anything. And expecting your horse to walk up to you and come comfort you and solve all of your problems is having an expectation. And um, that is not the horse's responsibility. (laughs) So um, I would say that it's probably a better idea to just, you know, relax and have a chill day or come back later or go sit in your car and scream to some heavy metal music before. Oh, my God. Wally's 
while he's purring and rubbing his face on my mic. Sorry if you can hear that. But, um, you know, go do something that get your energy out and then maybe meditate for a little bit and then go work with your horse. Um, okay. Section D, therefore, is it advisable and or ethical to train a horse while suffering from a mental disorder flare up when it causes conflicted, angry, etc. mindset? So this question is, uh, is another one like that. Is it ethical? So, um, as somebody who frequently struggles with fluctuating moods, depression, anxiety, um, ADHD, uh, induced rage, I, I feel like there's a word for that, but it's really, it's difficult to explain, but it's a very disproportionate, uh, anger to whatever has angered me. And it's not necessarily trigger stacking. It's just like, I get enraged by minute, obnoxious things like, um, like my dog, for example, when she licks her lips and like does a bunch of mouth smacking, like noises, it, uh, like I want to put my head through a window like it and I'm saying that because I'm sitting next to a bunch of windows um I'm not going to but like oh my god it makes me so outrageously angry and uh horses don't tend to do that to me I don't know why it's like just unique to anything but horses I'm sorry I'm trying to make the burps not so loud um oh my god now I'm yawning so tired. I'm going to get through this podcast for you guys, for you guys, and for me, because I also, like, want to answer this. Um, I'm just making sure that you guys know this is a consensual episode. I do want to be here. <laughs> Even though all of my animals are harassing me, they're like, uh, we need dinner, and I also need dinner. Um, okay, so I, it's, this is a tough question to answer. I mean, if you feel like you are going to cause harm to your relationship with your horse genuinely. Um, if you look at it from an um, objective position as much as you can, um, you know, then don't do it. But if you think that, you know, maybe you can handle five minutes of working with your horse and that you can affect some positive change, uh, then do that. You know, keep it short. Don't put too much pressure on yourself take it easy. And if things don't go the way that you're expecting them, it's okay to take breaks. It's okay if the horse, you know, it doesn't do exactly what you want it to. And I know it can be really frustrating, but, um, you know, just take a break, relax, give them a bunch of snacks on the ground and go sit for a little bit and take some breaths until you calm down. And if you just feel like you can't do it today, then don't do it. Um, I, I struggle a lot with my mental health and motivation and frustration and anger and all of those negative emotions are very present in my life a lot of the time. And it's really difficult. But, um, you know, and not everybody's the same and not everybody deals with it like I do. And, you know, obviously, McKenna, in your question, I'm not sure what mental disorder flare up you're talking about, but, um, you know, you're going to be the best judge of that because you know your horse the best and you will be able to recognize if you are doing harm or if you're doing good. But I do think it is important to consider that sometimes when we're struggling mentally, um, the lens through which we view our world is not always the most accurate. So um, it's important to, like I said, if you can, you know, maybe keep a training journal or write some notes down in your phone or something, whatever you can do to really look at things objectively and rather than, you know, too emotionally, I think emotion definitely has a place in horse training, but, um, you know, too emotionally when you're feeling really bad about yourself, you know, for me personally, sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm the worst trainer ever. I have no business working with horses. I suck at this. I don't know anything. And, um, you know, my rational mind understands that's very much not true. I know what I'm doing. I am a good trainer. I have done the research. I have done the application. I can do this. However, in the moment, sometimes I'm, I just want to throw my hands up in the air and just be angry. And that's fine too. But, you know, if you're in a place where you can look at it objectively and be like, okay, I still can train well, even though I don't feel super great, you know, I'm going to give it a go you know, say some positive affirmations before you do it. Find out what might work to help you feel a little bit better, at least for a little while so that you can get through the training if that's something that you want to do. Don't push yourself. Don't compromise your mental health. 
but you know if there's something that works for you like for me sometimes before I go out and work with the horses you know sometimes I'll flip through some training Instagrams or something and just get inspired and be like yes this is what I want to do I've got good feelings I'm going to go do it Um, or I meditate before and set my intention and just kind of like sit and think for a little bit like do I have expectations? Where am I at mentally? How do I feel emotionally? Am I too far down the rabbit hole of just like not being in a good mood and it's straight up not happening today? Um, You know, check in with yourself and you know you and your horse best. So it's going to be up to you. Um, Okay. Question number seven. We are out of number six. Um, On a separate note, do you know any sources that describe how to best transition a horse from daily feedings to 24-7 forage access? I found that Newt is uh, easily frustrated by hay nets, and I worried that it it would frustrate him worse to have forage he feels he needs to fight to get at. I worry about increasing the size of the net holes because I fear that he will try to eat it all too quickly. Do you have any personal advice on how to handle this situation? Um, Okay, so... Increasing net size holes, um, feel that he will eat it all too quickly. Um, you can try the hay dispenser balls. Um, that's something, or you could increase the amount of hay he gets. Um, often horses in stalls, um, don't get enough hay or they get like two flakes AM, two flakes PM. And when they're in a stall, they eat that within 30 minutes. And if it's in a hay net, they're eating it, you know, within... I don't know, maybe an hour or two hours, Um, but they're not getting enough. They're getting the same amount that they would have eaten then, you know, I mean, it might be the median between those two. Like maybe the time it would have taken them to eat that much grass would have been like 45. I don't know. But um, horses need to be eating all day long. Uh, On average, they eat about like, I think it's somewhere between 13 to 16 hours a day something like that is 70 to 80 percent of their day is spent uh grazing so um as much as you can to increase that i would do that um i would get him in a situation where he's out 24 7 that is the best um if he still has to be in a stall then um you're just gonna have to increase the amount of hay he gets um and you can have different avenues through which he can get it. You can try a hay ball. You can try one hay net with bigger holes, one hay net with smaller holes and see which one he chooses. Um, you know, and he can work through all three and just have different avail or different ways, avenues to get the food. Um, the resources on transitioning to daily feedings, this will be something that I'll eventually get around to putting in my nutrition tab on my website, but the feed room chemist podcast is going to be your best uh, best go, best chance on that. Um, I recently listened listened to an episode on going grain free. Um, I believe um that episode was very overwhelming for me, Dr. Jimmy Nichols. If you're listening, which I doubt you are, you're a wonderful individual, but sometimes you are too smart for me. <laughs> and I I so appreciate that episode because um I feel like it's a lot of what I do on this podcast. That it's like, let's attack this issue from every single angle and absolutely overwhelm our audience to the point where they're like, I actually have paralysis now and I can't do anything. Um, But it it can be difficult. Um, But I would listen to that episode and just know that you're probably going to have to get your hay and grass tested and still probably have to feed some sort of vitamin mineral balancer to make sure your horse is getting all of his nutritional needs met. Um, But as much forage as possible that is going to be your best go. I think that eventually out here, personally, we're going to try and transition our horses um, to more of a forage-based diet and feed kind of like a um, Timothy hay pellet uh, with the Stride Animal Health 101 diet balancer so that they're still getting all of their vitamin mineral needs met. Um, But it's a powder, so you have to like feed it on some sort of base. But I think we're probably going to transition to that eventually so we can sort of get away from the commercial grains. But not all commercial grains are created equal and they're not all terrible. I personally like the Blue Bonnet Intensify X Factor line. That's what we feed. Um, And Blue Bonnet has a lot of great feeds. And this is not sponsored in any way, shape, or form. But um, that Feed Room Chemist podcast is uh, 
it's created by Blue Bonnet and Stride Animal Health. They're, I think they work together. I don't know. I don't know all of their business details, but that's where I would go to get information on that. Um, there's more information um, on some, there's some Facebook groups about it. Like I said, I'm hoping to get that up on my website soon. Um, but huh, for you, McKenna, specifically, there is a, um, a section on the Discord. Since you're a patron, you will have access to that. Um, if you go to the Equitheory Discord server, there is a nutrition um, channel available where people have posted a lot of links to stuff like that. And I'm sure there's some information in there. And if not, you can ask on Forage Transition. Um, and then you can email me everything that you find so that I can put it in my nutrition uh, slot on my website. Okay, last question here with a very brain dead, tired Jill from talking for an hour and 45 minutes straight. Um, I'm also really freaking hungry. Like I'm getting dizzy because I'm so hungry. And I know I can hear all of you out there being like, Jill, the podcast is not that important. Take care of yourself. This is how my brain works. It's just straight hyper focus on one thing at the expense of needing to pee and having to eat. But I can't, I cannot make myself take a break and get up and go do that. I want to finish this. I want to get it done. And then I can have break time all at once. Okay. (laughs) Thanks. Um, okay. Number eight, what are your thoughts in general on the extreme Mustang makeover and the road to the horse competitions? I've been fascinated by the concept of them for years, but now have more knowledge on the science behind training. I've become begun questioning how they work do you know if there's any data concerning these competitions specifically that would suggest how these horses are more likely to have bolting bucking problem horse issues or even health problems post adoption or sale um i've yet to find any information on that but if you know any i'd like to look into it do you think it's possible to compete in short-term training competitions like this with clicker training of the clicker trainers i know uh there are very few that compete on a regular basis in hopes of refraining from putting too much pressure on their horses do you think that clicker trainers will ever be able to participate in these kinds of competitions what do you think it will take to get people to do so okay my thoughts in general are these competitions are um uh, well, the first thing that popped into my head, I'll just say it cause I'm tired, um, are ego demonstrations for trainers to prove that they can conquer a horse in three days or 30 minutes or whatever. Um, I think that it can be done kindly and well, but most of the time is not it. Like you said, puts too much pressure on the horse. It's way too much too fast. It's using a lot of flooding procedures it is not fair to the horse and is in general bad. Um, I know Mustang Maddie used to do a lot of those. I don't know if she still does. That would be one that I would look to if she does because she is wildly into clicker training now, is very talented at it. And um, I don't know if she still does them or not, but that's who I would look to for information on that. Um, I personally am not a huge fan of them. I was going to do the Retired Racehorse Project in which you almost have an entire year to get the horse prepped for it. Um, But the horse that I was doing, I was going to do positive reinforcement with it. And I just quickly realized he had a lot of baggage and I was not going to push him just so that I could do a silly competition when he needed more time. Um, So, yeah, uh, I don't know that there's any data specifically or if they you know, end up having problems. Some of them probably, uh, are going to be likely to have those issues. Um, but some might not, you know, it's, it depends on the horse. It depends on the trainer, the situation, everything like that, what specific, um, competition it was, how much time they had and all that good stuff. But in general, a horse that has been flooded, overwhelmed, uh, trigger stacked and put into a situation, uh, where they are in learned helplessness is probably, going to result in a horse that uh, goes quote-unquote psycho (laughs) after they are no longer in that, which we talked about earlier. Um, So do I think it's possible to do it with clicker training? Probably not because uh, clicker training is systematic and takes time and ensures that there are no holes in the training, whereas these training competitions kind of don't really care if there's holes in the training so long as, you know, you take a wild horse and you're sitting on it by the end of the training. There's this meme that I once saw that I will read to you now that's like this guy with his arm reeled back, like ready to, to s- smack some tape on something. And it says non-reputable horse trainers. And then it's like this big jug that's got a hole in it. It's leaking water and it says horse. So like, for instance, it's a flex tape ad. So this man's like non-reputable horse trainer about to slap some, some tape on a, uh, a leaking water container. 
that is the horse. And then it says he will be completely trained in two weeks. Um, that is a meme that is from Twin Pyres Equestrian. Pines, Twin Pines Equestrian. Okay. Um, they posted that and I thought it was very funny and also true. Um, your horse will be completely trained in two weeks. Uh, run for the hills, dear God. Uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of time to train a horse to be ready <laughs> for things like that. Um, and if you want to read a really great post on it, the, the account that I found it on was actually the Willing Equine, which is Adele. Um, but Alyssa.Lene, that's A-L-I-S-S-A period L-A-N-A-E on Instagram. Um, she wrote, or they wrote an awesome, awesome caption on that, um, about educating and how, how we expect our horses to be ready to go in like three days. Whereas how long do we spend preparing for our careers <laughs> as humans? Uh, like minimum 12 years of schooling, but, or tw- did I say 12? It's not 12. Yeah, it is. I don't know. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Because we started like five or six. Okay. Anyway, regardless, 12 to 13, not including uh, college or anything like that. Um, so it's really, really not fair. And that caption talks about that at great length and is amazing. So um, I, I don't think... I think it's possible for clicker trainers to compete in these, but I think we would have much more realistic and fair expectations of the horse in those competitions. And, you know, the clicker trainer might have them doing pretty cool things, but probably would not be sitting on them walk, trot, cantering, jumping, and loading into the back of trucks and stuff. Um, But uh, it depends, like I said, on the length of the competition. Like if it's a year long one, um, like I think the Mustang makeover one's pretty long. I could be wrong. I'm not, I, don't really know much about them don't really care to (laughs) um but with more time you know obviously you could you could do a lot but in the ones that are like three to 30 days like they depict on like heartland and stuff and um you know some of the ones that they do around the states and in canada and whatnot are just not good for the horses um but i have a kitty in my lap that's looking at me and really enjoying his belly scratches is so cute I think my mic got farther away from me, either that or I'm just getting quiet because my audio waves are getting smaller and smaller. Okay, so let's see. Um, Most clicker trainers don't actually compete that much. um, And yeah, okay. So, I mean, uh, there are some clicker trainers that do compete, but um, it this is always a tough question to answer. Like, why don't clicker trainers, why aren't they ever in competitions? Well, for a couple reasons, predominantly being that competitions are not set up for positive reinforcement. Um, you, and, and, and like take a dressage test, you're allowed to reinforce the horse the entire time by using pressure and aversives. You're not allowed to stop and give the horse a snack for doing it right because you didn't like, imagine going around on your horse and saying, you know, using verbal cues, trot, walk, whoa, canter, you know, and doing your entire test off of a verbal cue. And okay, maybe you have to stop after every 20th step and give them a snack. But how much more impressive is that to, you know, being able to micromanage their every move with your, you know, body weight, um, which is what a lot of riders do. Not everyone who rides traditionally, of course, there's the caveat. Um, But I mean, like, it, it, it's, you can't do that. So it's not set up for it. So we're not going to do that. I mean, I think Georgia Bruce is probably one of the only ones that, um, I am like aware of. I mean, there, there are plenty of others. I mean, like Shelby Dennis is one, but uh, Georgia Bruce is like the big one that, uh, everybody thinks of, um, that competes in clicker trains consistently. Um, and she will clicker train an entire test, you know, for dressage. And, um, you know, each step leads into the next for behavior train chains and things of that nature. Um, and you might have to fact check me on that. Actually, I'm suddenly feeling less confident, but I think that's, I think that's true. It could be, I don't know. Why would we fact check on those podcasts? Um, so I think clicker trainers might be willing to compete in them, but at the same time, it's, it's like, why, 
You know, it, it, I think most clicker trainers, it matters more that the horse is set up for a solid lifelong foundation than winning a competition for the sake of some, you know, trainer notoriety. Um, and what I was also going to say about um, training and competitions is that, so, you know, for a lot of clicker trainers, it gets really hard to like explain this because it gets sensitive and difficult to talk about, which is fine, because a lot of people get into working with horses and riding because of competition, and, you know, we all love it. I I miss eventing a lot, Um, but your priorities change, and that's not to say that people that ride traditionally or use negative reinforcement don't care about their horses. Um, Many of them do. Many, many, many of them do, but... Like for me with Zoe, when I switched to positive reinforcement, all of a sudden it was all about the, you know, the joy of training and the journey and just spending every day with her, not so much like it used to be, which was just like kind of novelty focused, like, oh, what's the next show we're going to do? What's the next course we're going to do? What's the next level we can do? You know, just pushing constantly rather than improving the little things. Um, and the, I, I, and you know, I don't know. It's it's just, that's more important to me now is to make sure that she's really comfortable and happy and is not in a situation where she's, you know, at risk emotionally or physically because a bitch do be colicking. (laughs) So, um, you know, it's, it's just my priorities have changed. And I think that happens for a lot of clicker trainers. Uh, when people are like, why is no clicker trainers competing? Well, a, because the, shows are not set up for clicker trainers. They're set up for traditional riders. So it's, it puts you at an unfair disadvantage, um, for one. And two, it's like, it's kind of not important anymore. Um, and I think a lot of clicker trainers out there that are listening will be like, probably nodding along to that. Some might not be, but, um, you know, it, it might be hard to understand if you haven't, made that transition yet or if you're not going to and maybe competition will always matter just as much as the horse does um you know I don't know it depends on your situation your circumstance your history your experiences blah 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 throw it back to Dr. Sarah Schulte here um okay so um that is actually it oh my god uh wow I think oh wait actually the last question what do you think it'll take to get people to do so but changing the rules allowing people to reward their animals and, you know, use tack that the horses prefer. Um, you know, requiring a noseband and a bit for dressage is a little bit limiting <laughs> for a lot of positive reinforcement trainers who don't like bits or prefer to ride bridleless or, you know, their horse goes better in a certain piece of equipment or without a certain piece, yet it's required for some godforsaken reason. You know, like, I'm not going to argue bits or nosebands or anything, especially not in this episode. I'm so brain dead. But, like, if a horse goes just as well as one horse does in a bit and noseband and flash and breast collar and everything without a bridle on and a neck rope and is round and lifted over the back, engaged, obedient, willing, why can't the horse do that? Why does it have to have its face strapped down? Like, what? <laughs> I don't get it. I'm not here to start a controversy. Uh, we're just gonna we're gonna end the episode before I get into something I don't need to. Um, I do plan on making a controversial tech video later because I, I started that <laughs> once upon a time. Um, but I do plan on making a podcast episode about it later, but not today. So thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you to Patron McKenna for submitting all of these amazing questions. I really think it was an interesting conversation and I hope that you guys enjoyed it and you let me know your thoughts on it. Um, With that said, um, be sure to, you know, subscribe, follow the podcast, rate and review. It bumps it in the algorithm. It helps me out. Um, So if you're on an app where you can rate it and review it, which I also just realized this this podcast is on Audible. So if you have Audible and you want to listen on there, rate it and review it, please. Um, But yeah, you can find us on jetequitheory.com and jetequitheory on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter, as well as Equitheory on those platforms as well, sans Twitter. I only have one Twitter account. Um, and I think that is going to conclude this episode. I will catch you guys next week. Please have a lovely one. Take care of yourselves mentally, physically, hug your ponies, appreciate them, and, you know, just enjoy the ride.
ride your dreams. That's what my parents, my dad's tagline for me was ride your dreams. It was on our trailer at one point. If you go back in my really old videos, you might see that. Um, and also when I was a child, I was gifted an iPod, like, and I think it wasn't, it wasn't the Nano. It was the, like the long skinny ones. Um, they're like, a, they kind of look like a big thumb drive, but skinny and like thin. And mine was blue and it had ride your dreams engraved on the back. It was my dad's like thing. It was really cute. Um, so yeah, do that. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening. I will catch you guys in the next episode. Bye.